<laughs> All right. Thanks everybody for joining us. And so uh, let's get started. So a couple new updates for me from last week. Um, in San Diego, there was an event associated with Science Online, with folks talking about open science and blogging and, and uh, how to promote science. Um, I was invited to speak about OpenWorm. I described the project. It was kind of um, pretty unique because most of the folks there were, were bloggers, uh, folks who write about and translate science and, and talking about how they use social media. And I was talking about how we've used social media to promote the project and to build the project. And, and uh, it was fairly well received. Um, I think there to uh, a set of tweets about uh, about the project. I think um, it's always fun to hear, uh, you know, what people think about it. Um, um, you know, who haven't uh, who haven't seen it before? I think a lot of interesting conversation came up. I pointed people at the browser. Um, people were excited. So, um, so that was fun. Again, it was, it was like a room of like forty people and. Again, people are like, wow, it's incredible, you know, what you're, you know, what you're doing here. So, um, so that was pretty exciting. Um, good promotion for the project. Um, probably some more followers. Um, so well, good. Uh, the other thing cool. in the last few weeks was we, um, we now have the, um, the instance of um, um, the instance of the Synapse software. Uh, up, uh, for marketing synapses, it's been up online. Uh, Cat made um, it's been online now for a week or so. So we met Cook and Andre last week to um, sort of talk about next steps. We finally figured out how to create users that are linked with projects, so we've done that. And Stephen Cook, who is back in classes now, but um, is uh, has agreed to uh, create a tutorial uh, for us so that we can. Um, Teach ourselves and others uh, how to mark synapses on this platform. Um, that's very good. Also, we learned a bit about the, a bit more. Hi, Sergey. We learned a bit more about the actual connectome uh, in that in that meeting, which I think was pretty interesting. Um, in particular, uh, we learned about um, how the connectome is is actually composite from a bunch of different uh, EM stacks. Um, I don't think I really appreciated this before. I don't think most people appreciate this, actually. Yeah. Uh, train over and. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I heard a train, and then it was Sergey smiling. <laughs> no. Um. Anyway, I was saying that the uh, that the connectome that we have is actually a composite from a bunch of different data sets that uh, that they put that. Um, you know, White and Brenner put together. So it wasn't a complete worm even from the beginning, which is interesting. So um, Steve Cook is working with sort of the one of the only people in the world who is trying to do even better than that. Um, and they basically, his graduate work, um, just to put it into context, is to take the old connectome, completely review all of the original data, and critique it, and then to republish a whole thing retake new images to the whole worm with EM and to uh, basically create a, an, up, an updated connectome that is um, more correct. So there's reason to believe that the current connectome isn't, um, isn't, uh, is not fully complete and um, is not from a single animal. Which, is uh, this, sorry, is this the Emmons lab? Emmons, E M M S. Okay. Yeah. They're the same ones that release a um, the um, update on a piece of the uh, mail uh, connectome uh, in a paper earlier this year, and that's in our that's in our Mendeley group. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that was all pretty interesting. So this whole synapse marketing thing is pretty relevant. Um, we we um, Andre asked about resolution. We learned that you know there's no. Is basically we can't do much better than the resolution that's currently there for the data that we have until they collect new data. Um, so, so that's interesting. Um, also, you know, there are a fair number of labs that do electron microscopy. Um, one of which, uh, you know, I've actually I actually spent time with my graduate graduate here. Um, but uh, the challenge is basically preparing the tissue to see it in the right way to. Um, so not very many people are investing in that. 
So anyway, um, bottom line in terms of deliverables, uh, Steve Cook said that you know in a, in a week or two uh, you can turn around this tutorial and uh, we can point people up and see how we can practically get to uh, getting additional people to market. Because the idea is that he's going to be producing more data, and that data either needs to be manually segment manually segmented by him. <laughs> I see you smiling at that. Or um, or hopefully folks on the on the um, on the cloud, or folks you know crowdsourced. So um, anyway, so that that project is making some progress. But um, but we do have you know we we have the the best connectome that exists now encoded into our you know neuroML. So for now that's kind of the state of the art. But um, but the point is is that within the next year we may see something completely new um, come out. And uh, and we can potentially even participate in helping it to come out, which could be really exciting. So we're still driving that forward. Okay. Um, so let's. Uh, I'll I'll be quiet, and uh, we can start the rotation. Um, folks, given updates. Um, Porig, you wanted to say something. Well, I was just going to. Um, well, maybe I'll wait till I come around to me. But um, I think. Uh, Saying we have the best connectome and all of the most up-to-date information, I think we need to be a bit more explicit about uh, where the sources are and have at least have a wiki page showing all the sources of this information and how it's actually been incorporated. Um, I think there is a spreadsheet, but uh, I think we just need some summary where all this data has come from and a more modular system for if somebody <coughs> produces updated connections from 20 specific neurons and does, has great data on uh, the synapse locations between them. We need to be able to have um, a kind of way to specify, well, this specific connection we are claiming has come from this data set or from another data set. So I think that would be very useful to get a system where you can trace back to the original data. Right. So the spreadsheets that are in our Google Docs folder for data do have the references in them. The one that's in that's out on the GitHub repository um, maybe just has, has been stripped has been stripped sort of more raw in terms of that. So we've basically taken one spreadsheet for all the connections and merged it with a spreadsheet that comes from uh, work that um, the gentleman named uh, Demeter Sterniov uh, produced for us. And so the the spreadsheets that are in our so the folders do have those references, um, but they are a bit buried. Um, let's see. Um, probably the, well, this gets to the wiki, but probably the, the page that describes the wiki should be the place that has these descriptions um, yeah. in terms of what the sources of those things are. Um, and since wikis are on the uh, subject for us to talk about, um, I'll put a pause yeah. on that. But. Um, that's absolutely true. I also have been devising a more robust plan for managing the data sets um, that uh, actually I've just been kicking. I just kicked an email over to Tim uh, in the last 15 minutes, uh, just thinking a bit more about that. We've been talking a lot about compiling you know, a master data sheet for the project. And I'm trying to think of how to make this as simple as possible for everybody. Um, so um, in the short term, we should do it on the wiki. In the longer term, I think compiling basically one master you know, spreadsheet, basically of all data with everything referenced, might be the way to go. But um, uh, okay. yeah, uh, but it's uh, it's absolutely true. So let me just mark down at least for the short term for us to update the wiki page with that uh, with that background. I think that's a that's an easy thing we can do sooner rather than later. Mm, would it be an option? And um, would it be an option to? Put uh, the, some references on the neuroml file itself. Yeah, I mean that's the um, idea I, I had was that I, ideally I should be able to, I mean for neuroml or neuroconstruct to be able to pull it out of a spreadsheet, which should ideally be the source of this data, but then flag in the neuroml file, put a comment against each of them, each of the connections, wh which data set exactly it has come from. Uh, so if somebody just gets neuroml, they'll be able to see. Or even it can be incorporated into a visualization too, but um, yeah, ideally, ideally this should go in the neuroml as well. Because that would mean that we would have only one source. Uh, I agree that depending on what 
we need to do. It's it's not a replacement for the for the spreadsheet, but I think it would be very useful while exploring in 3D the neuromel of the connectome that you can select a cell and then you can find the best side the properties, also the references, why that cell looks like that uh, and where the information of that connection is coming from in terms of scientific publication where the data was provided and I think that would give much more robustness and credibility to the connectome as a whole. Yeah. I like where you had that. So there's a script that generates that, that pulls from the spreadsheet and generates uh, the, the neuro construct project, right? Yeah. So if the spreadsheet is updated, then that script can get updated to include the uh, annotations, you think? Yes. Um, yeah, definitely. But um, uh, I mean, I thought, I mean, one other option is to have, um, I've just been working on this, some Python scripts to um, read in those connections, but make it easy to have a very simple format that you can, um, so, so those could be the kind of like baseline uh, set of connections, but then have a very simple format that somebody can import uh, individual connections or annotate in some way extra connections or remove connections or just comment on connections um, that can be incorporated into that kind of baseline connector, but probably actually putting everything into a, a well annotated spreadsheet is probably the best. Best bet. Yeah, um, you know the, the different technologies that are free. Are, <coughs> I, I note that uh, Google Spreadsheets recently updated their ability to comment on individual cells. Um, so uh, it's nice you can create like a threaded discussion on an individual cell and, and mark it up. Um, so I'm thinking that perhaps incarnating this in a, in a spreadsheet, which then of course can be downloaded into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, might be uh, might be a good place, but um, we can we can have a more robust conversation about like the data management. Um, uh, I think probably started on an email thread actually be the best way to go for now. Um, but I think uh, yeah, in the short term, let's let's mark up the uh, the wiki page and and then let's look at the, the spreadsheet for uh, for this annotation. But I, I I agree, Mateo. I I see where your head's at. Um, you might think that you might be able to graphically browse the, the connectome and get that those annotations out like in some other UI, right? Yeah. That would be pretty cool. All right. Um, so, Mateo, do you want to start? Do you have some fun things you want to? Uh, OK, F fun things. Well, um, I've been uh, working on. Um, on a couple of things, but mainly I've been working on uh, visualizing neuromel, okay? And we're doing that at the lab uh, in the in the context of the open source brain, and uh, at some stage uh, we're, <coughs> like, we're we're not ready yet, but at some stage uh, this uh, tool will be incorporated. And but I started developing this tool, and I can already starting showing you something and uh, in a while it will be clear why this is relevant to OpenWorm as well as open source brain. So this is a 3D neuromel visualizer on the browser. Okay. And um, classic for Kinji cell. So the yeah. <laughs> so Eric it, it, has spent many years working on this cell. <laughs> And um, and the and the information is coming uh, straight from open source brain, as in it's just a visualizer, so it's uh, it doesn't have any predefined uh, model uh, hard coded. And uh, the one interesting thing is that it obviously works also for the open source connectome. That we that we have. Just give me a second to swap. I, I'm literally commenting one line of code and I'm commenting another one. Don't you tell me. So that we can. Visualize the. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. 
Yep. So this is basically a, an open world browser, but it's not an open world browser. We're just showing the connectome of the open world of the C elegance that is at the moment checked in on open source brain. This means that if today, tomorrow, somebody goes there, updates the connectome because it updates the position of a cell, it updates, uh, well, it's not at the moment visualizing any connections, but that will be immediately reflected here. So it is a big change in terms of the open world browser where we had the mesh coming from Blender kind of frozen and, uh, you know, just being a snapshot, uh, this is more in terms of having a 3D visualization of a working model, which is the Neuromel. And I'm also working on another uh, feature, which is basically reading, uh, uh, basically gives the possibility to select a, a cell and read out from Neuromel the properties for that cell. So you will see here, well, actually, we. this is interesting to notice that we have the same uh, uh, values for all the different cells. But one thing that is changing is the ID. <laughs> so you will see that as I move my mouse, as I hover, and this is obviously the PVDL and PVDR are the coolest one to highlight. <laughs> and uh, so, this is um, this is basically the main thing that I've been working on, and why it is also relevant for the open world. Well, besides the fact that it will be possible uh, eventually through open source brain to look at uh, the connectome that we have checked in there. This is also relevant because the technologies that I'm using to build these are not uh, different from the technologies of the simulation engine, okay, for the open world. This means that uh, the model, the visualization model that is used, uh, basically the neuromel file is converted into a model which is displayed by this engine that uh, I'm writing on top of 3.js. And this visualization model is the same one that we were working on for the open world. So basically, in the simulation engine, the, ha having made this, it means basically that we are one step closer in the simulation engine to actually go there and visualize the simulation of the, of the network. Obviously, we still uh, need to write a proper solver. And in this case, uh, we're talking about uh, multi-compartment. So it's not that easy, but uh, we are definitely moving closer. And uh, the... Um, So this is an updated version of the, um, you remember the particle uh, demo that we had for the, for the front end? Okay, so this is a, an updated version. Ba basically, the model behind this scene is exactly, the meta model behind this scene is exactly the same meta model, which is behind the Neuromel visualizer, which we just have seen. And you can see like, the, it, 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 it basically is the same thing, if you want, just used in different contexts. So we're working uh, with uh, Giovanni to, uh, we're very close at the moment uh, to hook up this front end uh, with the SPH simulation on the back end, because uh, these particles that are shown here uh, are basically a mocked up version of exactly the same model that we will be streaming. And Giovanni is getting pretty close to do the streaming. So, I don't know, in two weeks' time, we could be watching here on the browser the, the SPH simulation. And uh, I think this is pretty much it. If I refresh, it changes color. This is a very interesting feature. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much it. So is that so? You're you're gonna get close to the web, the WebSockets uh, streaming implementation with those. 
Yeah, uh, WebSocket is ready. The front end is ready. Uh, there is some work that Joe is doing uh, that he will uh, tell more about, but it's in terms of uh, basically hooking up uh, the simulations, so what happens on the back end uh, with the front end. So it's really putting in place the logic for the sending uh, requests for simulation, getting results, streaming those results. But it's like all the components are in places and we're very close. Can I ask a stupid question? Sure. What exactly is a WebSocket? Um, it's the pipe <laughs> where you can send uh, data to the browser uh, basically in a sort of a continuous matter. Imagine that um, communication, um, so one, one of the classic ways to have a server communicating with a client is through a servlet and that basically means that the browser goes to the server, asks a question, the server replies, and that's it, okay? So it, it's like a question. A servlet is a question. While with a WebSocket, you basically open a channel where you can continuously transfer information back and forth without having to ask questions every time. So the difference uh, between uh, doing this simulation engine with servlets and WebSockets is that with servlets, you would be saying, uh, uh, give me an updated scene, give me an updated scene, give me an updated scene. While with WebSocket you will just say start give me, giving me updates and then you will receive them without having to ask I questions see. each time. Okay, yeah, I, 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 that makes sense. That's a good, simple explanation. Awesome. So that's really cool. Um, I'm really excited. Um, both with the interactivity and um, the connection to open source brain, the ability to see this stuff update in real time is all. This is all really exciting um, to see this all coming together. So I think that was a good place to start. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, you, also, Matteo, I mean, you guys have, have met about this as well, right? Uh, sorry, Stone, can you repeat? I... You guys have met about the simulation engine in the last couple of weeks too, right? Uh, yeah, I had uh, um, we had meetings with uh, with a meeting uh, with Lab and Sergey, and then last week uh, it was just over email. But uh, basically, it was for defining uh, this um, uh, some details. I, I, that some details about the visualization model, and then last week I started. Uh, a discussion with Sergey to have an SPH uh, model of the C elegance, okay? And basically, uh, what Sergey was saying is that it would be just a matter of having particles that are confined within uh, the shape of the C elegance within the mesh, and uh, to get these particles. I mean, there are ways that uh, at, at the moment those uh, two. Uh, geometries that you've seen in the particle model are basically a sort of a plane and a, a sort of a cube while uh, in uh, and it's very easy to generate a random particle within a cube to generate uh, a random particle within uh, a C elegance it's not as easy like uh, you have to write an ad hoc algorithm basically to check if a given point that you're generating is inside or outside uh, the boundaries of the surface or you could use uh, uh, ray tracing methods to basically one thing I was thinking it was to load uh, a collada file in the 3.js engine and then use uh, ray trace to calculate whether the particle is inside or not but uh, we also need to keep in mind that all of this will have to be done kind of once, uh, as in it's not a computation that would be ongoing during the simulation. It would be just uh, some algorithm to produce uh, an SPH model once for, it's basically something that you run once off and then you do have the model and that's what you would be loading in the simulation engine. So that is something that we need to keep discussing. Uh, it's not a highest priority, but it would be a requirement if we want to see a C elegance shape, the jello bouncing around. <laughs> yeah. Very good. 
So maybe this is uh, who wants to go next? Is anyone volunteer? Yep, Mike. All right. Seems relevant. Yes, sir. You've got some stuff to show too. Oh yeah. Um, Link so us, I guess my friend. My main visible contribution for this meeting is uh, there was a conversation about the wiki, which I think should what well, would be better if it was. Um, on the main site, just because um, I felt that what with having a GitHub repository and a Google Code, a Google Code um, website, whatever, and also having our blog, there was a bit too much fragmentation in the project. Especially as for most people, if they see Google Code, they think, "Well, that's the repository." So I felt that the wiki could be moved to the website, and so. I kind of decided to experiment with doing it myself. So if you if you go on that link which I've put in the chat, now keep in mind this is you know I've not, I've not done the full um, full conversion, but it's a sort of proof of concept yeah, prototype. Yeah. I'm using something called PM Wiki. Um, I know I know that um, Stephen wanted me to use something else, Media Wiki. Yeah. But after we can, some. You can talk about that, but. This is a really great start, and you've taken an initiative to so. Nice thing about PM Wiki is it's entirely file based, um, pretty simple to use. So I kind of decided that's the thing to go for. Now this website, which of of uh, this this wiki, it's it's, I mean it's ugly, no question about it, but it's pretty easy to change and change its appearance. So the main thing I've been doing is going through the whole markup language of the wiki, of the wiki, and changing it because unfortunately the Google code markup language is a bit different from this PM wiki markup language which is which and there's no like tool to do an automated conversion which is obviously a big pain but um, I think once once I've done the manual conversion and it does I've done 80 percent of it now once I've done that I think if everyone agrees we can make this a bit prettier um, I think Matteo and Giovanni are better than me at making things look nice. That's my Giovanni. I, I just uh, Giovanni. Then I just That's don't have I, I just don't have any artistic talent. So. It's also it's... known as the Matteo treatment. It's <laughs> not, not me. It's just trying to put it on me. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, this is entirely file based. So once I've got all the markup and whatnot ready, I can just send it to you as a tarball, and you can have another play around, and. We can. I, I still haven't um, put any users on it, but you know these are all minor things. So there's a few. There's a few more. A few more hours of work left. I reckon there's about four or five more hours of work in this wiki, and then the content will all be there, and it'll just be a case of making it nice and putting it on the website. And then I, I guess, then we can just um, de decommission the Google code, Google code entirely. And I don't think that's such a bad thing. I mean, yeah, yeah, we've got a high page ranking, but. The Open Warm website itself has a higher page ranking. Yeah, it's it's second. The yeah. openworm.org is right after the Google Code, so one would think that if we take that out, uh, Open Warm becomes the first. <laughs> yeah, uh, one would think. <laughs> well, no, I, on if I um, on my Google, because not all Googles are created equal. On my Google, if I Google Open Warm. Then yeah, I think I, if you log out, if you log out, it's the other way around. But okay, then the Google code is preferred if you log out. I think so, but I'm not sure. It's like it's personalized uh, results. It, <coughs> yeah, no, it changed. <coughs> it changed. It's not anymore it, preferred. Really? Yeah, I think openworm.org has now trumped openworm. This is what you get people. with a uh, yeah, drive. That's what I see. Yeah, that's nice. No, yeah, I get, I, I get it. I get the same. So yeah. Or open Worm, then browser, open Worm, and then Google Code. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, and then we can just have a sort of wiki dot open worm dot org, yeah. and everyone can change that. And we've consolidated some. We've consolidated some of our web presence, I think which it's I a, think it's a very good uh, idea. Yeah. It has much nice effort. And Joe, we should put a. Now that I look at it, we should put a maps uh, file. Yeah. A so that map. Yeah. the site map, yeah. So that it would look nice, and we could lo link the blog, the browser, all yeah, those yeah. things. But could we just just an XML file, just a matter of having half an hour? 
Yeah. Could we get rid of the splash screen? Yeah, well, I, yeah. I don't particularly like it either, so we might... <laughs> We probably made our point by now, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's technically... From a technical standpoint, I imagine it's quite easy. Yeah, no, it's just and yeah, take it out. So I the, think the everyone hates the, the, the open world site, just so everybody knows, is directly... Um, directly runs the uh, code that's checked into the GitHub repository for the website. So yeah. any changes uh, to the website can just be made first. Uh, in the GitHub, and then and then we just have to deploy that uh, out to the you know out to the site, which is just kind of uh, you know Mateo and Giovanni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then okay. every, every change so far, it's been checked in into GitHub and then uh, deployed. I'm a I'm a horrendous web designer, so I don't think I can I should be doing anything. Well, yeah, but like we we'll just, we'll just have basically get this wiki, get it to look like the website more or less. And then map it to wiki.openworm.org. Okay. Um, on the actual science side of things, um, very little progress really. Mainly, um, so with optimization at the moment, I'm just not doing very much because what I'm doing is essentially waiting for. Uh, um, I'm get, getting some significant computing power, so I'm getting two 64-core machines, and not really doing anything until until I get until that's delivered. But also, um, as we, we discussed last week, last meeting, integrating SPH and electrophysiology, and Sergey mentioned um, that he was going to look at porting the SPH solver to Ubuntu to Linux. And I wonder, Sergey, if you've made any progress on that, or if you have started? Yeah, I started, um, but I started only tomorrow. <laughs> no progress now. Okay. Well, as if any, if, if any news, I, 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 I send you an email. Sure. Okay. Well, just yeah, just keep, if you keep me updated with with okay. how that's going. Because okay. once 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 you once you sort that out, then I can really get started on the integration problem, and that that'll be quite a cool, okay. quite a cool thing, I think. So that's that's my my update. Very good. I love the wiki, man. Thanks very much. The, the yeah, taking the initiative. Um, so I think we definitely can put that in um, to the place where the other wiki was. Be good. All right. Um, all right, who's next? Volunteers? I think it's me. Giovanni. Uh, so yeah, just going back to what Matteo was saying, I'm working on this generic simulation bundle. Basically, the idea is that when I'm done, we just remove this uh, fake uh, server that we have at the moment <coughs> in the front, front end and just put the real one behind it. Mm -hmm. At the moment, there is a stubbed one that the lab uh, developed um, a few months ago. And that's what what's those particles that Matteo was showing are coming from a fake server uh, for a fake simulation. Um, now, we, we take that out, we put the real one in, and it streams the data that's coming from the SPH solver that Sergey ported from Andre's version a few months ago. It's a previous uh, snapshot, so it doesn't include elastic matter uh, or a few, not a few bar bug fixes that were introduced recently. But it's still good enough to to do some showcasing and uh, to get the technology right. And then the the idea is that in the future we port all those changes, we port them to the to the solver, and the same stuff that Andre is showing us. On his um, platform, we, we can we can see in the browser. So that's the big picture. In terms of, in terms of what I'm doing, last time I t I told you that I was working on this loading the simulation settings from a config file. All that stuff has been done, and then dynamically, what what I spent a lot of lot of time on was this uh, dynamic discovery of available simulators. 
So the way that we are doing this is uh, you can drop as many simulators as you want. So it could be neuronal, it could be physical. You drop them into the server and basically given the interface and an identifier that it's in the configuration file, you just say, give me an SPH simulator with this ID. And if, if there is one, it'll give it to you. So that, that logic is a bit, it was a bit complicated to figure out. But uh, like last week, I got it working. Uh, I was pretty happy about that. So that's done. At the moment, what's going on? It's a lot of refactoring and rehauling of uh, stuff that was already there. And uh, mostly, basically, the time that I'm spending now and what's missing is some logic around the buffering and the streaming, as in the solver will be running time steps simulating stuff and basically you need to to get that stuff out of the solver and store it into buffers and then start streaming it make sure that you're not storing too much stuff in the buffer because then it runs out of memory so like technical details like that just making sure that the thing is stable and then basically hook it up to the solver itself so that that's what I'm doing at the moment I just hooking it up to the solver uh, doing the actual processing and making sure that nothing breaks. Uh, so I'm at the point that you could define as I'm getting it to work. <laughs> most, of the, most of the work has been done. I'm just basically trying to get it to work. Uh, the bits that, that don't work yet, and I, I know that there, there are some bits that I'm still, I still need to impl change some implementations and stuff, but uh, it's close. Uh, it's not visible work, as in I don't have anything to show you other than the code itself. Uh, you can look, there's the activity on the GitHub repository. If, if you are curious about specifics, you can just look at that. Um, but that's pretty much it. I'm hoping to, to get somehow, some, some, somewhat of a working version this week, and then spend the, maybe we, our goal was November, so I have something by by the end of November. I think we are on track um, for the SPH visualization by the end of November. We'll probably be able to get it working before then, but it's not working yet. So I can I cannot say we are like ahead of schedule. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah. That's pretty much everything from me. There. Um. Can I ask a question here? Yeah, sure. With the SPH visualization, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm right to asking the question in the right way, but is the because the stuff you're talking about buffers and so on, mm -hmm. so is it is it going to work in such a way that the visualization is occurring during the simulation? No, it's it's going to be probably slightly delayed. Um, as in, the 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 solver runs faster. Then we can visualize stuff. Uh, really? Depending on no, it depends on how many particles you put on it. Hmm. Uh, so we need to make sure that you are not trying to show stuff faster than the solver simulates. So that's what I'm working hmm. on, I'm trying to avoid that. You're trying to stream stuff, but but you're still waiting for results. So it will, it will be like watching a YouTube video, Mike. So when you watch a YouTube video, like the video might not start right away because you're buffering, you're receiving sure. enough frames for the server, and once you have enough... I suppose well, what I'm wondering is why not run the simulation, store just, the results, yeah. and yeah. then play, which, which is what generally is done with Neuron. Because um, basically because the idea is that, first of all, there's going to be integration between... Uh, the physical and the neural, when the neural comes along. And the second is, if you remember the other example we had, you could change the current, right? So if you just play all of it, you're not going to be able to interact with it. So there will be interactions in the sense that uh, it's like the simulation Maybe. engine. The simulation engine is designed so that technically, OK, it will allow you to, like you're streaming the simulation, Okay, and you're seeing what happens. Then you could like select 
hundred particles and just delete them, okay? And then uh, the simulation will continue without those hundred particles. Now I just wonder if this doesn't add a lot of unnecessary complexity, though. No, I don't uh, think so. I don't. I don't think it adds complexity. Um, but I mean, I don't think the example Matteo uh, made was effective. Uh, explaining you why we're doing it this way. I think, and, and a better example in my view is, imagine that you could apply forces to those particles mm -hmm. from the browser. So you don't want to play the whole thing and then play it as a video. You, you, you're going to have interaction, it's just going to be a bit delayed, but hopefully not no noticeable. Same as the, you remember when we showed the thing with the current, we're changing the external current of those neurons. Yeah. So, in that as well, it's a bit delayed, but you don't notice because it's just streaming so, so much stuff. Uh, so the idea is the same. The idea is that we're building something that allows you to interact with it. Uh, so that it's, is basically the reason why. It, it, will be like, it will be like playing a video game, as in uh, imagine yeah. that we have to uh, think in terms of not what the simulation engine can do now, but what the simulation can do once mm. it's finished. Uh, and with all this simulation, like you will be able, for instance, uh, to do things, and I'm talking obviously years okay. ahead, but we need to plan it since now, you would be able to instantiate in your environment uh, something that the C elegance could potentially interact with, drop it in the environment, but the fact that you're dropping it into in, into the environment, it is a user decision, so it's not something like uh, your mm. simulation is completely predefined up front. No, yeah. you have a real-time engine that can calculate what happens as you interact with your sim. If you guys think it's not it's not it doesn't create a huge amount of extra work then sure. it does create some extra work but i think it's worth it and mm. it's pretty much done i mean the the, the alternative uh, would be to just have something that play, plays back <coughs> some data which is mm. which is fine and it's usually well, the way that's, yeah, it, it yeah, works that's almost yeah. every yeah yeah which is fine it's not wrong it's just that one of the assumptions we had from the beginning is that we wanted to interact with the simulation and this, the example for that was the change in the external current in the other in the other demo. And in this one, we would like to have the same to retain that that uh, that kind of interaction, even even if it's not clear what the interaction would be if you're just showing particles at the beginning. But once we do the integration, you could imagine that you select a neuron, and uh, you just send a pulse to it. Yeah. So you, you, you want to see what happens straight away, uh, rather than play it back and then wait for the thing. I actually think a video, yeah. game, a video game is a very good way to think about it, yeah. actually. Yeah. A sort of yeah. useful video game rather than... Yeah, it's real-time interaction, and it will be delayed, but as long as it's not like five minutes after, then for you yeah. it's real-time, and that, that, well, that's, that's the assumption. Video games yeah. Work as well, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that is why. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, it is definitely extra work. There's no two ways around it. As in, you have to worry about stuff that you wouldn't have to worry if, if you had if you were to just like play it back, which is which is an an approach that's perfectly fine depending on what you're trying to do. I mean, one of the uh, fee, the um, uh, requirements we we set for ourselves was this bidirectional um, interaction, as in people you can interact with the thing and. That that is why, basically. Yeah. Yeah, you've convinced me. Happy to be here. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Who's next? Uh, let's see. Well, let me try. Um, Andre. Well, during the last um, video, uh, I was focused on. Um, how to perform um, muscle contraction uh, in the longitudinal uh, direction. Um, it is easy to make this for a pair of um, mass points uh, or for some small uh, number of mm, strings uh, which mm, model uh, some piece of muscle. Uh, but uh, when we have a number of 
particles about uh, uh, ten hundreds or more in the system, uh, it's quite hard to uh, address to them. Um, for example, to some uh, piece of matter, uh, elastic matter composing a worm uh, to make it uh, contract. Um, and contract only in the mm, specified direction, uh, not uh, uh, every, but just one. Uh, so I have some ideas here, some mm, attempts to implement them, but it's still not uh, working good enough uh, to show the kind of uh, new video. So I just uh, continue, uh, and uh, one more point. Mm, well, I still think that the worm should be filled with liquid, uh, and uh, even if I make um, the worm shell uh, four uh, slices of mm, elastic matter, uh, four layers of elastic matter, uh, particles of liquid inside still escape uh, outside, and that disappoints me, um, but mm, real um, relation uh, between uh, widths of the warm shell and the warm uh, diameter um, is quite big um, volume, and everything uh, which is, uh, uh, every wide which is wider than uh, one layer is um, significantly uh, more than reality. So we need uh, something like um, additional uh, condition uh, for particles not to uh, fly out uh, some um, surface which uh, is built uh, on the um, particles of elastic matter which compose a shell of the worm. Um, so mm, this surface should be composed of triangles built on those particles and um, when uh, every or each particle attempts to cross uh, one of these uh, triangles, uh, it should uh, be affected by a force which uh, should lead it back. Um, almost like uh, the boundary conditions do, but boundary, co boundary conditions are static. Uh, they do not move during the simulation, and this one uh, should be able to move uh, and should be built at each time on the actual uh, worm's shell uh, mass points positions. Uh, so this is the next problem which I'm trying to solve as well. Uh, that's all. Cool. So, um, in, in terms of arbitrary force fields, um, within the, uh, you know, or between, between particles, how hard, how hard is that to implement? Um, Uh, sorry, how to implement what? Uh, arbitrary forces between particles, um, like the pulling of the muscle. Oh, well, this is not a problem. Uh, you can just uh, address to a pair of particles, I and J, uh, and um, some given force. Uh, so at next step of integration, it will be applied uh, to this pair and they will, it will uh, lead to a contraction. Uh, the problem is when there are many such particles and um, for example, uh, one muscle is positioned at uh, some place um, and they want at the beginning of the program to, mm, for example, to select uh, all the um, particles which correspond to this muscle, uh, select uh, all um, pairs 
um, ING, uh, which are inside this muscle and um, should contract. Um, so I will want to make this procedure uh, maximally automatical. Um, Does that make if you imagine a cube, right, and yes. it's got a bunch of particles through it, that you could you could choose pairs along a given direction, right? You could choose pairs moving in the x direction, or pairs in the y direction, or pairs in the z direction, and yes. and depending on which you know which ones you chose, you'd, you'd have different kinds of compression happening between all the particles in between. So we so right. probably it's useful. So certainly the algorithm allows you to do it, but I, it's it's probably useful to have some higher order functions that let you define which um, along which internal groups of particles you want the compression to to happen, um, so that you can write a high level function which just says you know, compress. Um, it's almost like kind of defining fibers, like muscle fibers. Yes, fibers. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, right. So, so just having a, a couple order, um, a, a couple of abstraction levels above the individual particles would probably be pretty useful to make arbitrary muscles. Yes, fibers is a very good term, but, but just when we work with a worm, um, it's um, the system of coordinates uh, and fibers direction. Uh, are attached to the um, surface of the worm, which is not um, parallel to x, uh, y, and z uh, axis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it <laughs> has some more complicated form, and this is yeah. a task. So, right. so each each particle will, in some sense, have its own coordinate system and define its own x and y and z. Is that, uh, what I'm thinking is, imagine you have a, mu a muscle and it's bent like this, then to define a contraction, two particles here will contract in this, dire in this direction, two particles here in this direction, and two particles here will contract in this direction. So, I'm just trying to understand yeah, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is the coordinate system cannot be canonical. It has to be local to each pair of particles, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'm gonna let, I'll let Andre answer, but I, I think there's like, there's the muscle when you initialize it, and you might imagine that having one coordinate system just so that you can index which, um, which uh, particles have connections between them. But then once time starts, you know, this thing can flop around because it's a bendy thing. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer, so you, you don't really worry so much about the position of the particle. You worry about its index and its, its I guess, its ID, um, I would imagine, in terms of knowing that you should compress between, you know, particle A and particle X uh, as opposed to particle B and particle Z. So... Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. I'm just I'm just imagining how this could work. Anyway, we don't have to hash this all out now. But I'm just yep. agreeing with this. Not getting both in there. Um, we can probably move on. Um, unless Andre, did you want to say anything else? Not me. Oh, I'm, I'm complete. Okay. Right. Awesome. Who's next? Uh, maybe yeah, uh, I, I am. <laughs> uh, I'm working on boundary particles. Uh, still working, and uh, in this time I wrote about eighty percent of <coughs> code. I test it and check it now. Uh, so I think. Uh, it will be complete soon. Uh, also, I am just started to porting SPH to Unix platform, uh, so there are no so much use. That's all. Stan. Um. Now you met with 
with Mateo also. Um, so that all is going along well. Who else? Okay. Um, I don't have too much of an update, unfortunately. I haven't been doing very much on the project, but um, I just did in the last day or two start looking at and thinking about um, representing network connections in NeuroML2 because um, Matei has been making great progress on the uh, uh, networks. Um, also representing the uh, morphologies in um, the uh, WebGL. So um, the reason they look nice is... Sorry, are you getting feedback here? Uh, I am hearing some background stuff. I'll just one second. Me now? Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, because Matteo is making great uh, progress with the uh, morphologies, um, we need to be able to load in um, the network uh, cell positions. Uh, that isn't a big problem because they're all positioned at zero, and the x, y, z are um, positioned relative to the origin, so it all looks nicely laid out. Problem is the connections. So. Um, we need to do a little bit of work in uh, Network in L version 2 to support all of those connections because it's not just from cell A to cell B, it's also from uh, segment uh, X to segment Y on postsynaptic cell. So um, that all needs to be incorporated because we haven't really looked at that yet in NeuroML version 2. Uh, so I've started adding some Python scripts in the C Elegans project which can read in the, actually based on uh, Mike's um, libneuromel, uh, to read in the morphologies in neuromel version 2, read in the um, list of existing connections and try to uh, either analyze them in some way, test that they're all there, compare them to the um, spreadsheet, uh, but also ideally uh, be able to add in, um, well, my initial thought was to be adding add uh, connections from other sources to supplement the ones from the spreadsheet, but another scenario would just be to uh, take all the have references in the spreadsheet and add all this information from the spreadsheet and then perhaps produce an updated NeuroML with all this information. So that's really just started, so hopefully I'll make some more progress on that over the next week or two. Awesome. Open source brain is... Uh is a good home. It's a good home for the stuff. So exciting. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. hopefully, a lot of the tools developed for this and um, for visualizing all this information um, will be as applicable for C elegans as anything else. And it would be nice to have a cortex model and cerebellar model beside all of these as well. So, yeah. all right, great. Maybe Tim. Yeah, I just uh, continue to pound away at data, trying to um, gather the thousands of data elements that make up um, the metabolites and the gene expression. So I, I keep putting a little bit out there on the Dropbox because um, I'm, I'm I'm trying to start to focus in on the neurons themselves more than other parts of the uh, worm. Uh, but there's hundreds and thousands of data elements, so it's like any project where you have all these different pieces out there and then I'm trying to just just get all those pieces out laid out and then I'm trying to figure out how it, it's all interconnected and intertwined. So it's it's gonna be quite a quite a project and it's gonna take quite a while to uh, pull all these pieces together but I'm starting to dig into it and find some great great information out there. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit on my side, but um, I think I saw you put a, a new spreadsheet out there actually recently. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I've got some data out there that I've, I've, I've pulled together. It's out there on the Dropbox. There's a spreadsheet and some pictures. Yeah, so I think it's it's worth folks looking at stuff like this. Um, and um, some of the images that are there in terms of the, uh, the metabolites um, and the me metabolic pathways that have been found in C. elegans. Um, right. And I don't know <clears throat> if folks can see this 
uh, image that's here. Um, okay, I'm gonna do a link. Yeah, I think. Uh, right there. So we click on that. So the um, uh, sometimes folks have asked, like, what is what is the pathway? Um, it's basically just transformations of molecules and other molecules <clears throat> that are facilitated inside of a cell. But this is sort of a attempt to map out all of the different things that go on inside of a of a C. elegans cell. Um, and uh, this is kind of an equivalent. There's an equivalent diagram inside the car the car model the uh, the uh, mycoplasma, uh, which was, which had to be simulated in terms of code. So uh, Tim has been, you know, looking through the, these equivalent sorts of data and starting to collect them together. Obviously, they're complicated because we're talking about, um, uh, I think, um, like 180 times more DNA inside a C. elegans cell than there is in mycoplasma. Right. Right. Yeah, so, and keep in mind that the map you're looking at, if you click on any one of those elements, it turns into a whole other map as you drill down. And a lot of those turn into maps further down. Yeah, this this one's a PNG. Is there is there a dynamic place where this is? or? Yeah, it's, it's, at a, it's on a website. Um, uh, I, it, we're on, on the computer I'm on, I don't have um, any links to it. Okay. But, um, but the spreadsheet's got this website uh, on the, under the neural metabolites. It's got the um, a link right at the top. So anyway, it'll, it, it'll be a little while before we get there, but it is interesting to yeah. think, you think about the SBML uh, type work to think about, you know, what, what sort of form could we encode a map like this in that would Enable us to translate it into, say, an SBML type of uh, representation, even if it's just to capture the data in a digital way that isn't a PNG. Um, you know, even if we don't have great ways of simulating it yet, but just to think through that process um, and uh, and have the and have them interconnected, eventually to start to think about you know how the ion channels get produced and implanted into the cells and. This is a bit more of a long-term stretch thing, but it is. I think it's always good to have that um, and, and have somebody thinking about that. So that's why I'm like to, to, to wrap his arms around the data that, that are out there. Um, and uh, yeah, and as such, we're 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 talking. He and I, um, hopefully, again later this week, um, just about how to collect this data together in a single place um, and have it cited this week. Inza, you're back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Excuse me. Uh, my internet just broke down. That's okay. Yeah. How's it going? What's what's up? Yeah. What's new? Yeah. Uh, I'm still working uh, in Andre's team, and I'm working on a new but uh, small task. I am. <clears throat> I'm working on the method to calculate the mass of each at particles. Um. If we are given the um, density of the um, worm, for example, we can give the um, density of the water to the worm, and uh, we are given also the the form of the worm when it stays still, and we need to calculate the um, volume of the worm uh, based on the mathematical approximation, and then with the density and um, and the volume we obtained we can calculate the mass of the whole worm and basically we need to use um, 10, 10 thousands or, or 50 thousands particles to simulate the worm and if, if, if we divide the mass of the worm uh, by the number of the articles we can obtain the mass of each article each particle and with this particle or with this mass of particle we can process our simulation so that is what I'm working on and secondly, I want to say that uh, since I have already finished my program in Russian, I'm going. I'm living for China, and I'm going to work in Hong Kong maybe. And I hope uh, to let more people know our project, Open Warm, in China and in Hong Kong. That's all. 
That would be great. That's really cool. That's awesome. Please do. Um, so are you going to be in Hong Kong or are you going to be in Beijing? Uh, I, I'm going to work in Hong Kong in, in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Okay. Because um, actually I want to apply for PhD program, but um, it's a little bit late for this year to apply for this co program. So I'm going to work as, as a, a research assistant in Hong Kong. And at the same time, I hope to keep on working on this prog program, on, on this project, Open Warm, and in Andre's team also. Awesome. I know that sometimes there can be some tricky, uh, some tricky firewalls between China um, and uh, when it comes to things like some of the Google technologies. I know there are some things that are blocked. Uh, I would think Hong Kong would be the best place compared to, say, mainland. But um, if you have, if you run in, into any trouble accessing any of the materials that we've put out publicly, please drop me an email uh, and let me know uh, what you can't access because. Uh, yeah, I'd love to have other folks, you know, in China helping out, but I, yes. I, I know that sometimes it can be tricky. Okay, I That's think awesome. in the mid in the mainland China we have some problems of access to the internet, but uh, in Hong Kong I think everything is free. We are oh. free to access to the internet, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm going to see. Okay. Well, anyway, that mass thing sounds really important as well. Um, that's something I've been I've been thinking about and wondering um, how we're going to deal with that. So I'm glad that uh, that you've worked on that and uh, continuing that. I think that's that makes a lot of sense actually. Um, so awesome. Um, well, have a, have a good trip, and I'll, you know you're you're on all the uh, all the mailing with a lot of content. I'll invite you again in two weeks if you're there in two weeks. Hopefully, you can, you can get on from Hong Kong. Yeah, I think um, in two weeks I will be in the conference. Okay. Okay, great. Awesome, guys. Wow. Well, so it's pretty awesome two weeks. Uh, a lot of good stuff going on. Um, so we'll meet again in two weeks, and then I think two weeks after that we'll um, contemplate sort of our next big push. Um, we'll start. We'll go back into long-term planning mode, thinking about the six-month uh, sweep of things. Uh, think about getting ourselves reorganized again. Think about uh, you know what changes you know at any kind of structural organization level we'd like to make um, because we're kind of coming at the end of our our, our last sprint, um, our third sprint, uh, our third release, I guess I should say. Also, we should think about um, now that we're transitioning our web properties as well. How how the project looks to somebody who comes in for the first time. Um, but. Uh, yeah. Does anybody else have any closing comments? Any last uh, things they want to say? Uh, on November fourteenth, uh, uh, which would be Wednesday, two weeks time, I think. Yeah. Uh, we'll be myself and Porig will be at a conference uh, about smarter science. It's okay. called Smart uh, here in London, and I also uh, applied to uh, bring the. Open Worm Connect on poster. Oh, cool. And so on that day, uh, I think we won't be able to attend uh, the Open Worm meeting unless we move it. Okay. Uh, right, Borag? This is. Uh, yes, I didn't realize it was on the Wednesday of the. Um, yeah. Yeah. Open Worm, but yes, 14th, that would probably make sense. Um, I think, yeah. I don't know whether a moving it to a uh, Tuesday or a Thursday might be useful, or maybe we can just do it offline and see whether people um, can. Yeah. Let's see. Does anybody um, else have any conflict with that date? I think we can only do it. How do people think on Thursday of that week, the 15th? <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Any, anybody not able to make it move one day later? Works for me. Okay. Hearing no objections, I will move. Uh, I'll move the meeting one day later to the fifteenth. Um, and uh, yeah, if anybody has any trouble with that, just let me know. But uh, should all now have. Updated invite for that. Okay.
Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Awesome stuff. Looking forward to two weeks from now. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.